Good morning. All right. I'm always a little more tired at the 9 a.m. service, so I need you guys to energize me. So I want you to join with me for a few minutes, imagining that, that we're sitting in a movie theater about to watch a movie. So in your mind's eye, picture the seats that you're in, movie theater seats, and you're looking at the movie screen. The opening scene fades in, and there sits a woman on a couch, paging through her best friend's bridal magazine. See, all this lady is thinking about is the day that she's going to get married. She always dreams about that day. She always mentally prepares for that day. She simply cannot wait for that day to arrive. So one day with her friend, she goes to a social function. And there he stands. Perfect hair, perfect teeth, perfect body. His clothes are pressed and his shoes are shined. She introduces herself to him and they get to know each other. And they start dating. And the more she gets to know him, the more she realizes how truly perfect this man is. He always knows what to say. He always knows how to act. He always ha- knows how to handle himself in every and any situation. But that's not all. This, this man is also extremely intelligent. He knows a lot about a lot. From politics, religion, and ethics, to, to business, relationships, and civil matters. This man has it all. He's top notch. And this woman couldn't help herself but to feel drawn to him. And then, after some time of dating and then getting engaged, that day finally arrives. She gets to say, I do, to the man. She makes that lifelong commitment to him. But it's only a matter of time before she soon finds out that though he is perfect, there's one part of him that she really can't stand. He's a perfectionist. In other words, he's perfect, and he expects her to be just as perfect as he is. Now, there's something really difficult about living with someone who is perfect, someone who who never makes a mistake. It begins to wear on her. It wears on her relationship. It begins to wear on her life. This woman tries to be perfect. She really does. She tries to say the right things. She tries to to act the right way. She tries her absolute hardest, but she fails. Time and time again, she fails. And when she fails, well, that's when the pressure really begins. That's that's when the, the condemnation and the judgment really start hitting on her. And as time goes on, the more the woman begins to realize that the standard set by her husband is impossible to live up to. The initial thrill of having met Mr. Perfect has now given way to self-condemnation. And the more she fails, the more miserable she becomes and the more burdensome her marriage is. It becomes a very heavy burden for her to bear. Then one day, seemingly out of the clear blue sky, she gets introduced to a young man. Now there's something about this young man, something that she's drawn to. She can't quite put her finger on it, but she does know that this young man is different, and he's quite attractive. Of course, she remembers she's a married woman, and she's she's made her vow to Mr. Perfect, till death do us part. So as a faithful wife, she puts that young man out of her head as, as much as she's able to, and she continues on in her difficult, burdensome, and for all intents and purposes, impossible marriage. Day in and day out, her life and her marriage to Mr. Perfect, it grows into a lifeless and depressing and seemingly inescapable routine. And sure, there are some days that she rises from her pillow in the morning with a renewed sense of determination, but time and time again, she inevitably lays her head down on her pillow in the evening, defeated and stressed and with a sense of worthlessness. That is until another day arrives. The day she wakes up, turns over in her bed, and looks at her husband, and there he lies, perfectly still, with his perfect hair, perfect teeth, and perfect body. It takes her several minutes to realize that Mr. Perfect is perfectly dead. (laughs) Now, she should have been heartbroken. She should have been torn up about it. But deep down inside, she she breathes a sigh of enormous relief because she now realizes that this burdensome and impossible life she's lived has come to an end. Now, no sooner had she discovered 
Mr. Perfect Dead, then was there a knock on the front door? She gathered herself together the best she was able to and goes to the door, opens it. And who does she see? None other than that young man who has come to reintroduce himself to her. So she began to spend time with this young man, feeling drawn closer and closer to him. The young man would write her love letters. They'd talk often. As, and as she became convinced that he was head over heels in love with her, she began to fall deeply in love with him. And then the day arrived when they get married. And she realizes that he too is perfect. But though he's perfect, there's something very different about him. See, he'll point out her faults, but then he'll help her to try to be better. He enables her to do right. He encourages her and helps her every single time she falls down. She soon realizes that she's experiencing a complete heart transformation. She starts to say the right things at the right time. She finds herself forgiving others she had once resented. She starts loving others she'd previously deemed unlovable. And she starts selflessly serving others in a way that she would have never imagined possible. And she does all of this not because she has to, but because she wants to. She and her new husband live happily ever after. Then the story ends. And the screen fades to black and the credits start rolling. And on the credits, she sees, we see Mr. Perfect was played by law. The woman was played by you. And the young man was played by Jesus. See, this movie that we all just played in our minds is not unlike what the Apostle Paul lays out for us in today's passage, Romans chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. So let's take a look. Starting in verse 1. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you have also died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So, so what we see in this passage is, is Paul laying out a principle in verse 1. And the principle being the simple truth that the law is only binding on a person as long as that person is living. And death releases a person from the bondage of law. And then in verses two and three, Paul illustrates that, that simple concept, similar to, to the way we did in, in our make-believe story. And, and all he's doing is he's simply trying to illustrate the binding character of the law. And to do that, he presents the case of a woman who's married to a husband and remains bound by law in relationship to that man as long as he's alive. And during that time, she's not free to seek another attachment. She can only do that in the event that her husband dies. And if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, she, she'd be an offender against the law. She's called an adulteress. But to be joined to another man after her husband dies is perfectly legal and acceptable. So in the event of her husband's death, the woman would be completely free from the law that once bound her to her former husband. And then we see in verses four through six, Paul starts to uncover the spiritual truths behind all of this. And essentially what Paul says is, is that as followers of Jesus, we're in solidarity with him. If you remember that word solidarity that Pastor Dave used a few weeks ago, we're in solidarity with him just as he died, just as Jesus died, we therefore have died to the law. But not only that, just as Jesus was raised from the dead, our solidarity with him results in our having been made alive again. So we can boil down the essence of these six verses to one great truth. We have been set free to live as lovers of Christ. 
We have been set free to live as lovers of Christ. Now, and this is the, the great truth that you see in this entire passage. And so two weeks ago, we began a new section in our studies in Romans. Um, we're, we're looking at Romans chapter 6, 7, and 8. And we're calling this a series under new management because we're examining the implications of what it means to be in Christ. In the first half of chapter 6, we learned that because of our standing in Christ, we can have victory over sin. Time and time again, Paul tells us that as believers, as people who have through faith been identified with the death and the resurrection of Jesus, we've died to sin and we've been made alive. And then in chapter 6, verse 14, Paul said this, he said, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. But, but it's as if Paul anticipated some errors, so some objections maybe to, to what he says here. So he goes on to protect against uh, two errors, two extremes, the extreme of license on one end and the extreme of legalism on the other end. See, on one end of the, the spectrum, you have license, and license says, I'm under grace, I'm, I'm not under law, so I can do whatever I want. AKA, I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. That's license. And then Paul then devotes the second half of chapter 6 to explaining that, no, that's simply not true. He clarifies that just because someone is under grace and not under law, that doesn't give them license to sin. You either serve sin as your master, which finds its end in death, or you serve God, which finds its end in eternal life. Now in the beginning verses of chapter 7, Paul cautions against the opposite extreme. See, here you have license, here you have legalism. And so what do I mean when I say legalism? I've seen legalism defined this way. An attitude of mind which gives excessive respect to the law and which seeks to enforce conduct of a similar kind in others. See, legalism can take many forms, and it's not as uh, obvious um, sometimes as spotting uh, when a person is given to license, but the common denominator in all forms of legalism is that there's an excessive or improper use of the law. But we're going to see that Paul's telling the Christians in Rome that they've been set free to live as lovers of Jesus, and this is the great truth, again, that we find in this passage. Now, inherent in this great truth are, are two lesser but uh, smaller, I should say, two smaller, but no less great truths. Two truths that make this freedom possible. And the first one that Paul expresses is that we've been liberated from the chains of legalism. We have been liberated from the chains of legalism. So let's read again verse one. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? So Paul's beginning this section with a rhetorical question. Don't you know that the law only applies to a living person? He's addressing both the Jewish and Gentile believers here in Rome, but but what does he mean when he says law? What's he referencing? Now, it's quite possible that he's talking about um, Roman law, Greek law, all different kinds of law, but uh, whatever he has in mind, he certainly has the Jewish law in mind also, the the 613 uh, laws of Moses, the Mosaic law. And Paul's real interest here, though, isn't necessarily in identifying what law he has in mind. His real interest is in pointing to the very character of law itself. That law is something that, that has a binding nature, a binding force. So Paul uses this rhetorical question to call attention to the obvious truth that the law only has authority on a living person. And then he illustrates this principle in verses 2 and 3. Let's look again at those. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she's released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she'll be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but if her husband dies, she's free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. And to use the language from the marriage illustration earlier, Paul's saying that before we became Christians, we were married to Mr. Perfect. But when we became Christians, we died to Mr. Perfect and got married to Jesus. And that's exactly what he says then in the beginning of verse four. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ. Christ. 
So Paul's illustrating our union with Christ using the metaphor of marriage. Just as the death of her husband frees a woman from the marriage that that had once bound them together, Paul declares that we have died to the law. Now, the verb here where it says, you have died, it's actually in the passive voice, meaning that it's something that has been done to us. It literally says that, that we were made to die. We didn't, we can't put ourselves to death. We've been made to die by the divine act of God in response to faith in Jesus. So the law in all of its various forms of rule keeping and religion and legalism, the law no longer has authority over us. It no longer has us bound up in the chains of lifeless legalism. So what does this mean for us? How does this apply? What difference does this make for you? Well, let's talk about that. First, very importantly, it means that if you are not a follower of Jesus, you're still in bondage to the law. You're still married to quote unquote, Mr. Perfect. In fact, this is one form of legalism. See, this form of legalism believes the lie that says, I can secure God's favor. I can secure God's favor. You try to live your life doing enough good things that might outweigh the bad in hopes that God will look favorably upon you. But this is not the message of the gospel. In fact, this is where Christianity stands in stark contrast to every other religion known to man. And to name a few, the religion of Buddhism teaches that nirvana, reaching nirvana, requires a a strict adherence to the eightfold path. We call that legalism. Eastern uh, Eastern Orthodoxy teaches that faith in Jesus is necessary for salvation, but not faith alone. It holds that part of the process of salvation is based upon the adherent. That's legalism. Islam teaches that salvation comes to those who obey Allah sufficiently that the good outweighs the bad. Again, legalism. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that salvation comes by strictly following the biblical law and by obedience to the watchtower government. That's legalism. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the souls of those who accepted Christ and performed sufficient acts to be purified of their sin, go to heaven. That's legalism. And the list goes on and on. So if if you've been hanging out in this camp of legalism, I urge you to put your trust in Jesus alone for your salvation. See, biblical Christianity teaches that, that all of us have the same fundamental problem of being separated from God, and no amount of religious rituals or law-abiding acts can bridge that separation. The only thing that can accomplish that is faith in Jesus, who paid on our behalf the penalty of sin through his death on the cross. So allow God to, to sign the death certificate that signifies that you've died once and for all to sin, and to legalism. He offers you a new marriage certificate, one that unites you to Jesus. Okay, so that's one lie of legalism. Keeps the law in order to secure God's favor. But then there's another lie of legalism, and it says, I can supplement God's favor. I can supplement his favor. Now see, a person in this realm of legalism either keeps certain laws to maintain salvation or adds to those laws in order to maintain salvation. I've seen so many Christians wrestle with with the idea that they're obligated to obey the letter of the law or to even add to them because they're convinced that their strict adherence to them will ensure that God continues to look favorably down upon them. They must do one thing or the other. They have to follow specific commands, not out of a place of joyful, personal worship, but out of a place of lifeless legalism. And I've experienced this personally. A Christian school I attended uh, in eighth and ninth grade was the epitome of this form of legalism. One day, some of the teachers were tasked with searching all the uh, students' backpacks while we were sitting in chapel. After chapel ended, I was called down to the principal's office because one teacher found a Sony Walkman CD player and a stack of Christian rock CDs in my backpack. I was told that Christian and rock music don't belong in the same sentence together. So they held on to them until I finished out the end of the year. Now, according to many of the teachers there, and 
uh, leaders in the church to which the school was attached, it was wrong to go to the movies. You couldn't play cards. You couldn't read anything other than the King James Version. It was sinful for men to have long hair. You couldn't have a tattoo. That was a sin. And the list went on and on and on. You should have seen their reactions when they found out that I played the drums. And like the day I, I left there, I got my ear pierced. I think half of it was just to annoy them. But <laughs> now, now, it's important that you don't hear what I'm not saying. Okay, I'm not telling you to surrender any biblical convictions you have that flow out of a place of communion with God. But what I am telling you is that if you do or don't do certain things because you think that that somehow God's continued favor and grace depends upon it, you're guilty of legalism. You're flirting with Mr. Perfect and you're you're placing your affections in something other than Jesus. And we need to remember that obedience does not lead to freedom. Obedience is not what leads to freedom. It's freedom that leads to obedience. See, if you get that backwards, you start living a life that resembles that you have no freedom at all, and eventually you'll probably have very little obedience as I've seen time and time again in so many of the, the students from that school that I'm friends with on Facebook, it's just so sad to see how miserable they are and, and how they're, they're just lost. So listen, we can't secure God's favor and we can't supplement his favor. His grace and his love for us are steadfast and they don't fluctuate based upon our performance. They're extensions of his unchanging person. We can't add to them as if they're, they're somehow lacking or incomplete. We've been liberated from the chains of legalism and we need to rest in that truth. And then the second truth expressed in the rest of this passage is that we've been joined to the risen Jesus. We have been joined to the risen Jesus. Let's look again at verse four. Likewise, my brothers, you've also died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. So just as the widow is free from her relationship to her former husband, Paul's saying that believers are free to be joined to another husband. Salvation brings a complete change of spiritual relationship just as remarriage after the death of a spouse brings a complete change to a marital relationship. The believer's death to the law doesn't produce a lawless, unloving believer. We didn't die to the law just to to float around in no relationship at all. We died to the law and we're united with Christ. And that's the purpose. So what's the product of this spiritual union? Look again at the end of verse four. In order that we may bear fruit for God. You see, salvation produces total transformation. And a transformed person will bear fruit for God. Just as a husband and wife will bear fruit, the fruit of children, so too should our union with Christ result in spiritual fruit. So what is this fruit? Who are these spiritual children? Well, I can think of nine children that should be born into every Christian life. Their names are found in Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, and here's the kicker. We can't muster these things up in our own strength. It takes the spiritual DNA of Jesus to do these things. Because he is love. He is joy. He is peace. Jesus is patience and kindness, and goodness. He is faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. So all of these are a result of being in union with Christ. And that's at least one aspect of the fruit that he wants to produce in our lives. And then Paul continues in verse five. He says, for while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. So here Paul's reminding his readers of the things that characterized their old lives as unbelievers before they were joined to the risen Jesus. See, as as unbelievers, we were living in the flesh. 
As unredeemed people, separated from God, we were only able to operate in that realm called the flesh. And Paul here is using the word flesh to to denote that old sinful nature, that natural and wicked sphere of fallen humanity. And being in the flesh is the opposite of being in Christ. A person who still lives in the domain of the flesh cannot belong to Christ. Paul will make that clear later on in Romans. Of course, it's possible to fall back into some of the ways of the flesh, which we do every single time we sin. And even though fleshly attitudes and actions can manifest themselves in the lives of believers, we can never again reside in the domain of the flesh. And while we were in that state, Paul goes on to say we were ruled by sinful passions, which were aroused by the law. And Paul's not saying that the law is where our sinful passions originated from. The law is a beautiful thing. And we'll learn more about the purpose of the law next week. But what he's saying is that what the law does is it identifies and forbids those passions, which tends to stimulate in us an even stronger desire to want to do them. It's not much different than last Sunday when I was just getting ready to walk out the door, have holding the... Elizabeth's hand, Elizabeth is our one and a half year old, and she lets go of my hand and starts walking slowly toward the parking lot, and then right when I shouted at her, Elizabeth, get back here! She was what? She was stimulated to no longer even walk. Now she ran (laughs) to the parking lot, away from me. It's not unlike that. And then Paul brings this section to a close in verse six. He says, but now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Now notice it says we're released from the law. This means we're discharged or annulled from the law, our previous marriage partner. It enslaved us in bondage, but we've died to it. And why did we die to it? What's the purpose of this newfound freedom? It's so that we serve in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. We died to the law, not so that we can sin more, but so that we can serve. Death to the law makes servants. It doesn't make sinners. But notice what kind of servants it makes. Does it make legalistic servants? No. Our death to the law and our union with Christ produces believers who serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Getting out from under the law puts our life on a whole new basis, the basis of the spirit. If you're a believer, God pours out his spirit into your heart and it's the spirit who works a newness in you from the inside out. He writes the law on your heart and shapes your will and your affections into Christ-like loving service and obedience. We no longer mechanically obey a set of rules. Now we lovingly obey the spirit of God who fulfills the righteousness of law in us. See, someone who just begins playing the piano can play a piece of music, letter perfect, and still not capture the inner spirit of the song, that the way it was intended to be played. So now you and I capture the essence of the law because we've been given the Holy Spirit. Our obedience to God is not that of a slave fearing a master, but that of a bride lovingly and freely pleasing her bridegroom. We are free. You are free. You've been set free to live as a lover of Jesus. You're free from the bondage of the law. You're free from legalism. You're free from shame. You're free from guilt. You're free from fear. You're free from insecurity. You're free to serve God, not on the basis of you have to, but on the basis of you get to. You've been set free to love your Savior as you never could have under the law. As a lover of Christ, you're free to receive God's mercy. You're free to move on from your broken past. You're free to pour your heart before him. You can stop running away from him, turn around and turn to him, run into his arms and receive the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness and the freedom that he offers you. There's a pastor and a seminary professor by the name of Steve Brown who wrote a book called When Being Good Isn't Good Enough. 
And I love one of the stories he shares in this book. Here's what he wrote. Early in my ministry, I counseled a woman who, some 20 years before, had been unfaithful to her husband. For years, that sin had haunted her. I was the first person she had ever told about it. After we talked and prayed for a long time, and because I knew the woman's husband and knew that her revelation after the initial shock would probably strengthen their marriage, I recommended she tell her husband. It wasn't easy for her, but she promised she would tell him. Pastor, she said, I trust you enough to do what you ask, but if my marriage falls apart as a result, I want you to know I'm going to blame you. And she didn't smile when she said that either. That's when I commenced to pray with a high degree of seriousness. Father, I prayed, if I gave her dumb advice, forgive me and clean up my mess. I saw her the next day, and she looked 15 years younger. What happened, I asked. When I told him, she exclaimed, he replied that he had known about the incident for 20 years and was just waiting for me to tell him so he could tell me how much he loved me. And then she started to laugh. He forgave me 20 years ago, and I've been needlessly carrying all this guilt for all these years. So perhaps you're like this woman. You've already been forgiven years ago. You've already been set free from the bondage of guilt and fear and legalism. But you've never really experienced it, or you haven't allowed yourself to believe it. If that's you, spend these moments ahead and the week ahead preaching these truths to yourself. Spend time talking to God and reading his word. We've been liberated from the chains of legalism and we've been joined to the risen Jesus. So would you stand and let us worship him, energized to serve him and love him in freedom and in joy.